So prediction is a tricky business. Um, you have to step outside of yourself and your fragmented view of reality, your own belief systems, and you have to see all kinds of tremendous abstract patterns, politics, culture, technology, in order to step forward and see how things are going to advance. Now, chaos theory would tell us that we can't predict the future at all, but that's not entirely true. We can't predict black swan events, so we can't see the invention of the printing press coming, or computers, things like that dramatically change the rules. They rewrite what is possible with reality. But we can do a kind of Monte Carlo analysis of the future, and we can say if things keep going in this direction, that we can see strong branches of how it might play out. Of course, predicting the future even five or 15 years in advance is tremendously difficult. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go five, 50, and 500 years and the good news is I'm going to be dead in 500 years, so none of you will be able to tell me I was wrong. This is a bit like trying to climb Mount Everest with no Sherpa, no oxygen, no shirt, and no shoes. But I am going to do it anyway because it's a lot of fun, so let's dive in. In five to 15 years, what's going to happen? Well, not much is going to happen in five years. Things take longer than people imagine. There's a moment in Black Hawk Down where the helicopter crashes and the soldier says, how long is it going to take to get that on the, into the air? And the engineer says, five minutes. He says, nothing takes five minutes. We've been wired by Wired Magazine and things like that to think that our technology changes every five seconds, but it does take a little bit more time. And AI, it's important to understand, is a dual-use technology. It's both good and evil. It exists on a spectrum, and it's going to reflect our values us as the creators, both good and evil. So what are some of the good uses of it in the next few years? Probably the best use is in healthcare. If I take my camera, I point it at a worrying spot on my arm, it's gonna tell me whether I should call the doctor. If I send that image to the doctor, the triage nurse is gonna know that I should jump in line ahead of the hypochondriac and the old lady who just likes talking to doctors. In the current day, she has no idea and she can just lump me in with everyone else and I may not get to see a doctor for two months. We've already seen applied AI start to work. There was a Kegel contest in 2017 to develop better algorithms to predict lung cancer, which is notoriously hard to do. It has a tremendous false positive and false negative rate, which means people get the wrong care or not enough care. And we're already starting to see the results of that million dollar prize deployed in hospitals. These are some of the things that are coming in the near future that are going to be tremendous. And a lot of people worry about the death of all jobs. We'll look at that when I talk about 50 years. But right now, I feel that there's a stronger push towards creating centaurs. Now, the term centaurs come to us from Gary Kasparov. Gary Kasparov uh, lost to Big Blue famously. He was a grandmaster, lost in chess. And the next year, most people don't know that he started a contest, another type of chess, centaur chess, where you can enter an AI, an AI human team, or a human. The AI human team destroyed the competition. That's very interesting. What's more interesting is that it was three experts and an AI, not a grandmaster and an AI. And that means that the AI and the humans were leveling up each other's intelligence. And we're going to see these types of alien thinking that we see in AI start to level up all of our collective intelligence. Think about something a company like Stitch Fix, which delivers women fashion boxes. They have genetic algorithms that cycle through all kinds of fashion designs. But there is a human in the loop, a designer who looks at it and says, this is a terrible design, those shoes will never go with that, and maybe try this color scheme and do these different types of predictions. So we're going to see more and more of those types of things. But there is a dark side to how some of these things are developing as well. And China is already directly ahead of us in, in many aspects of how this is being deployed. There's a city in China where they have an Alibaba-backed city brain, monitors 50,000 cameras in real time, and detects car crashes in 20 seconds or less. Now, that sounds wonderful, because we want to detect these car crashes and have ambulances get there. But there was a leak last week where there was a police database with no password out on the web, where the journalists were able to log in and see that all of that data was feeding into track dissidents and undesirables. So the question is, who gets to define the bad guys? 
in the near future. And the bad guy changes with the definition of who's in power. And I recently was at uh, AI Night in Paris, and I was watching the various talks there. And all of the talk was on collaboration, ethics, human-centered AI. And this is all very noble, and we should be having these discussions. The problem is none of it is going to work in the near term. And countries and companies that have uh, less worry about data privacy and ethics are going to have a tremendous early advantage. And in fact, what we're probably going to see is places like China become the AI training center of the world. People will mouth the rules of the, of the EU or the United States or whoever puts these ethics panels together. They'll take their AI over to China. They'll train it there on the data sets that they don't have to get any permission off. And they'll take the weights and the artificial intelligence designs back to the EU and the United States and run them there. So over time, as we change the way that these things work, the EU's approach will become better and more useful, but in the short term, it's going to put them tremendously behind versus these places that don't have any ethics. So let's move forward 50 years into the future. Everything has woken up. Everything is smart. Your necklace is babbling away with your girlfriend's pearl earrings as she gives a talk in Brazil. How do we advance the technology? One of the ways that we might do this is through the Human Connectome projects. These are projects where we're trying to map every neuron in the human brain. And just like the Human Genome Project in the past, it will take decades and cost billions of dollars. Now, we might not be able to understand the universal learning algorithms of the human mind, but we might be able to hack them by watching them in real time. And so this is just one path towards the future. And naturally, these are going to give us all kinds of new chip designs. We're going to move past the poisonous rare earth materials of present chip designs. And we're going to start working with carbon, the building block of Mother Nature. We'll start to see hardware become wetware. So what does this get us to? All of a sudden, now I have a smart bandage that tells me I have an infection. I can see it on its little gauze screen, or maybe I should go to the doctor, or maybe it's releasing antibiotics as it's needed. Or maybe I have a pill bottle that tells me it's time to take my pills, or it tells me don't take these pills because you were drunk last night and you already took them. And we're going to have AI personal assistants that know more about us than we know about ourselves. So maybe that AI personal assistant will comfort us when we have a bad breakup, or when our friend is mean to us, It'll order a bottle of wine when we're on our way to a party and direct the self-driving car to get there. And when we get to dinner, maybe it'll pick out a nice place for a date, and maybe it'll whisper sweet nothings in our ear to tell us what to say to seal the deal with a night of fashion. Or maybe it'll tell us that the person sitting across the table from us is crazy. They're a HCP, a high conflict personality, and we should get up and say, oops, it's nice meeting you. Maybe we can have coffee next week. We're also going to see all of these objects around the world wake up. So self-driving trucks will be hurtling across special roads in China and the United States, hundreds of miles an hour. It's kilometers per hour for you guys. And they'll just be flatbeds with wheels. They'll have no cab for humans to drive them. And there'll be smart shipping containers on there. And every object inside of it will be tracked on an augmented reality internet. And that object will be tracked in space throughout its entire life cycle. And when the dish breaks, it'll exercise its own warranty and call for a new one to be printed off of your 3D or molecular printer, or a new one to be drop shift in an hour by drone, if you want it to be done. So these are the types of things that are coming. We're also likely to see if we explore weapons technology. So let's posit a scenario where there's a World War III. We've seen the decay of democracy on the world index for many years, rising authoritarianism. Let's posit a scenario where self-driving cars start to take over and fast food robots detonating a bunch of jobs quickly. Now, we've already destroyed many of the jobs in history 90% of the time. Nobody tanned leather or hunted the water buffalo before you came here to make your clothes. 
uh, or to cook your own food. So we've already created more jobs, but sometimes there is a breakdown where we're not able to absorb the shock and maybe governments aren't there to move fast enough. Artificial intelligence will play a tremendous amount in those wars. All of these simulations of artificial intelligence now that are beating real-time strategy games at Defense of the Ancients and beating ancient war games like Go will evolve to simulating through billions of types of battles and become experts in guerrilla warfare and total warfare. They'll direct the generals what to do. Robotics will play a tremendous part in any type of war, whether those are pack animals or actual robotic soldiers or autonomous tanks. And so, more bots will probably die in a war than human beings. But even if we have a war, it will not be the end of all things. It's always the end, the war to end all wars. Humanity rises like a phoenix from the ashes again and again, and war accelerates technology. Quantum encryption, quantum computers, digital ledgers, wetware, 3D printing, molecular printing, all of these things start to come together. And all of a sudden, the artificial intelligence is that we're taking heavily bearded special ops soldiers and directing them in battle, are now teaching children how to deal with bullies and make friends in school. All of the AIs that were directing their battles are now repurposed to run entire economies. And they can make decisions faster than we ever could and much better. If we have an AI doing budgeting for the roads, it's much better than a bunch of old men horse trading so that they get something opened in their home state because it'll be much more efficient. And all of the killing fields are paved over and suddenly we have parks. So what does AI look like in 500 years? Humanity has busted the bounds of this tiny, frail blue planet drifting lonely in space. We've pushed out into the solar system from the glittering rings of Saturn with self-assembling civilizations to the red hills of Mars and invisible nanosects constructing buildings before our very eyes like magic. Giant ships with elephant trunks are sipping precious gases from Jupiter and taking HE3 along invisible superhighways to power micro-reactors, micro-fusion reactors that power the world economy. The AIs that make the decisions for the government and corporations and decentralized autonomous organizations are able to adjust economies in real time and future shocks that would have crippled old civilizations on Earth and had people rioting in the streets if they happened once a decade will now be gently absorbed if they happen every three months. All, everything will be accelerated. All of these things will be moving faster and faster. The AIs will simply dial down production, dial down all of the advertisements that are micro-targeted so that people are not craving these things, and then dial the advertisement back up with micro-targeted ads that know precisely who you are better than you do, and you are just another programming interface. And they'll know how to get past your unconscious defense mechanisms like a micro-tailored drug bursting past your blood-brain barrier. And the people who control these interplanetary dynasties and governments, the question is whether we will be able to call them people at all. And the answer is no. They'll be something more than human. They'll be post-human. And what does that mean? Well, all of the AI alarmists proved to be right. AI does destroy humanity. Just not in the way that we thought. It's not going to be Nick Bostrom's super intelligent, super wacky machine that decides to turn the whole universe into paper clips, which is a ridiculous concept, Mr. Bostrom. And it is not going to be Terminators rising. In fact, I don't fear conscious machines. I think that we should fear something else. Unconscious machines, driven by humans with traditional petty desires. And so these post-humans are changed, and AI destroys old humanity by moving inside of us. Those centaurs become a very real thing. Suddenly I have a computer the size of a pebble on my spine, 
and I'm able to run virtual copies of myself and my personality, V cells. I'm able to do 10 or 100 different tasks at once. And the way that I will be thinking is vastly different than anyone who's able to think today. We won't even be able to comprehend it. The thoughts of post-humans will be as alien as we are to Cro-Magnon Man. And post-humanity will develop in fits and starts. There will be blowback, humans who want to preserve the status quo or human thinking. And we'll see these sort of back and forth battles. Perhaps World War IV and World War V are fought that way. But eventually Homo sapiens will be destroyed, not in a giant cataclysmic battle, but in the same way that Neanderthals were just outmoded by Homo sapiens. These post-humans will be able to think faster, quicker, and in parallel, and eventually they will simply outmode those humans as they become more and more powerful. And for them, swapping out your arm is the same as swapping out your cell phone. Why wouldn't I swap out my arm if it lasts five times longer and gives me 10 times the tactile sensation? Why wouldn't I swap out my eyes if they will give me meta information about the world around me? And instead of just looking at you and seeing you're wearing a white shirt, I know your name and where you've been and where you work and everything about the last time that we spoke together. Because I'm really tremendous with names and I can't remember any of your names. But what if it was able to tell me, oh, remember when we talked the last time about self-driving cars and this guy was really smart. So these types of things will happen and they will be these types of humans will move into a brand new types of ethics, and their thinking, again, will be alien to ours, and we won't understand them, and we'll be worried about that, but we shouldn't be. Evolution is inevitable. You cannot hold back the tides of the future. You cannot hold it back any more than the Japanese when they tried to keep guns off the island in favor of swords. It happened for a very brief period of time, but eventually, gun beats sword. And eventually, evolution is inevitable. The future is now, it's already happening. And all we can do is strap into the rocket ship and hang on for the ride. I'm Daniel Jeffries. You can find me on Medium by Googling Daniel Jeffries on Hacker Noon. You can find my books on Amazon. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.